All right, we got some breaking news that came out just at the top of the hour, and it is this document in which the special counsel's office has made a request to the judge in the uh, in the indictment of Donald Trump in the case against Donald Trump for a protective order for the documents, the discovery of the documents that are required that they hand over to the defense. Here's the gist of the argument. It's several pages long, but the, the government writes to the judge. On August 2nd, the government sent a proposed protective order to counsel for the defendant. Defense counsel substantively responded on August 4th today with a different proposed protective order that did not, in the government's estimation, protect numerous categories of sensitive materials, including grand jury material, materials and search warrant affidavits. Continues later to say, and in recent days regarding this case, the defendant has issued multiple posts, either specifically or by implication, including the following, which defendant posted just hours ago. And it is this true social post that Donald Trump posted in all caps in which he says, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. The government continues, if the defendant were to begin issuing public posts using details, or for example, grand jury transcripts obtained in discovery here, it could have a harmful, chilling effect on witnesses or adversely affect the fair administration of justice in this case. I'm going to pick that up in a second. But if you believe Donald Trump, America's prosecutors are doing what he does, thinking always and only about him. Prosecutor Alvin Bragg of New York. <laughs> who campaigned on the fact that he would get President Trump, district attorney in Atlanta, who is doing everything in her power to indict me. A special prosecutor named Jack Smith is only looking at Trump. Okay, let's evaluate that for a second. The day Donald Trump was indicted, the, the attorney general, Merrick Garland, was at a community block party in Philadelphia for the national night out against crime. Yesterday, the day Donald Trump was arraigned, the Justice Department announced six guilty pleas in a horrific case of racist police abuse in Mississippi. The Department of Justice has 115,000 employees. Three of them were representing the government in the case against Donald Trump. The Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, has been busy working on multiple cases, including the indictment of a New York pedicab driver for bribery and multiple indictments in different murder investigations. The Trump case is just one of many that his office is working on, and it's one of many very similar cases that he's prosecuted. In Georgia, where Fonnie Willis is expected to announce charging decisions in her investigation into efforts to overturn the election in that state, she told reporters yesterday, as she was at an, annu uh, at an event at an Atlanta technical college that her office has 380 employees and is managing multiple high-profile cases at the same time. These prosecutors are not like posters on Twitter or whatever it's called now. They're not interested in a media battle with Donald Trump. They're professionals who want to win cases in court, and to do that, they have to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. The special counsel, Jack Smith, has brought an indictment against Donald Trump for his actions leading up to and including January 6th, which means that Jack Smith and his team believes that they can successfully convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt of the facts in that indictment. This is too big and risky a case to wing it. And for a practitioner's view of making a charging decision, joining us now is Mimi Roca, District Attorney for Westchester County, New York. She previously served as an Assistant United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York and is a familiar face to all of us. Mimi, nice to see you again. I want to just, I want to just go back to this thing, this request for a protective order that the government has asked for. There's always a protective order in things like this to say that when you get discovery, you don't get to go and post it and talk about it and do things like that. What's the connection between what the government wants and Donald Trump's post in which he says, if you go after me, I'm coming after you? Um, hi, Ellen. Great to see you. Um, well, clearly, the special counsel is concerned um, about the charged defendant's interference uh, attempts to tamper with potential witnesses. And we heard the judge explicitly warn Mr. Trump about this in a way that was quite above and beyond the standard warnings about not committing crimes. It's a warning that I've heard most often in organized crime cases and cases where um, there's specific uh, sort of evidence of attempts at tampering already. And I think that they're concerned, you know, grand jury testimony in particular is 
the testimony, the record of what witnesses would be testifying at trial. And they're concerned clearly and understandably so that the, the defendant, Mr. Trump, will use that testimony to get people um, or himself to go after these witnesses and intimidate them so that they don't testify at trial. That's clearly the concern. And it's, again, understandable. What do you make of his demeanor in court yesterday, where he seemed to be listening to the judge and calling her your honor, the judge magistrate? And, and she admonished him very specifically. She didn't make any reference to him, but she did say, you know, you're not allowed to mess with witnesses. You're not allowed to intimidate people. It seemed like she went one step farther than what would typically happen in this case to sort of say to him, you're going to get in trouble if you, if you try this stuff. Yeah. And I mean, look, judges do that a lot. Uh, they don't do it often in sort of white collar fraud cases like we're seeing here. But you would have to have your head in the sand to not know that this person, Mr. Trump, uses his widespread social media influence to call out people. And that is something a judge has to take into account. And while those may not be crimes in and of themselves when he does that, as he's done many times since 2016, um, it can be a violation of a court's order. And judges take that very seriously. And the more clearly you warn someone about that, um, they should be on notice. That's the fair thing to do. And then also it's more likely that the judge can fairly impose some kind of penalty uh, if and when it happens again. What's your uh, I, this conversation that I was initially going to have with you about the idea that Donald Trump would like his supporters to believe that prosecutors get ex get get elected and think about Donald Trump from morning to night? You have been on a, a you have been a prosecutor in a, in a number of different places, uh, and now you're a district attorney. You got a lot of stuff you got to do. Your 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 uh, electors, your people who vote for you, actually need you to keep their communities safe. Maybe some of them are concerned about Donald Trump. Maybe some of them are. Yeah, and look, I mean, I can speak from personal experience. I've publicly uh, stated this before. We did investigate some conduct uh, connected to Mr. Trump and um, the Trump Organization in Westchester County, because whether you're a local prosecutor or a federal prosecutor, you're looking at the jurisdiction over which you have um, authority and saying, is there a harm to my jurisdiction, to my community, whether it's you know, physical harm or economic harm or deceit. And you examine those facts and you decide, do these facts constitute a crime and is it a crime worthy of charging? And can I prove that crime? And are there other barriers like the statute of limitations, et cetera? So there's so many different factors that go into whether you can actually or should actually charge a crime. I did not end up charging a crime. And, you know, I think that's an important point for people to know, because I have been an outspoken personal critic um, of Mr. Trump as president. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go charging him with crimes that right. are not chargeable or, or worthy of charging or able to be proven in court. And I deeply believe that that is um, I can't speak for every prosecutor, obviously, but I, I think it, anyone who looks objectively at Jack Smith, um, you know, he is not a political creature, a political mm. animal. He is a prosecutor through and through. And, and again, prosecutors don't don't typically bring cases for their own satisfaction. They, they bring cases that, as you have pointed out, need to be won and can in which a jury can be convinced that that this will happen. There has to be a likelihood of success for a prosecutor to want to go to trial. Exactly. And I mean, it would be foolish to bring a charge just for some you know, personal or political reason, because at the end of the day, facts and evidence are what you need in court. And if you can't have that, you as a prosecutor, not that we never lose cases that are worth bringing, we do, absolutely. But there's a difference between losing a trial um, that was, you know, admirably charged and brought and, you know, juries decide what they decide versus bringing a case that you never, clearly never could prove and shouldn't have brought in the first place.
I have to say, there's a piece of news we got at the top of the show, and that is in response to a true social post by Donald Trump, uh, the federal government is asking for a very specific protective order around the documentation required for this trial. And they, they were responding to a post that was put out there uh, this afternoon in which Donald Trump says in all caps, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. We have no idea who he's talking about or who he's threatening. But this this kind of thing is real to people like you and people in Arizona where you've actually seen the threats that you face just for telling the truth, just for counting the votes you're supposed to count. Yeah, Ali, uh, first, thank you for having me. And second, yeah, it has directly impacted uh, myself, my family, colleagues, former colleagues, people I don't know, but it's not just here in Arizona. It's all over the United States of America. The Brennan Center put out a study uh, indicating that we've lost uh, experienced elections officials across the United States because of things like this. We had one elected uh, official whose dog was poisoned uh, because of the lie, because of the threats, uh, because of the way this has really uh, manifested, the way that it has metastasized into a part of our society that's willing to act illegally, that's willing to make these threats uh, just because one person lost an election and cannot come to terms with the truth. Your actual election in Arizona is, is entirely tied to this, this scheme to, uh, to, to, to overcome come the election results, the actual election results in Arizona. And what was interesting about it is that you were supported by Republicans in your states as, as state as well as Democrats, because they believe that Adrian Fontes ran the election in Maricopa County the way it was supposed to be run. It gives me faith because the indictment makes me think that America is going to hell in a handbasket. But actually, your victory and the victory of others in the, in the last elections in Arizona suggest to me that Republicans and Democrats across this country don't want to buy into this nonsense. Well, Ali, here's the thing. The, the nonsense really is that it's nonsense. And thinking Republicans and other, you know, nonpartisans, people who aren't into politics that much, they understand that rational government, reasonable government, not run by conspiracies and lies, but run by folks who really care about getting the job done, is good for business. It's good for science and it's good for technology. It's good for the arts. It's good for medicine. It's good for law. Not being insane about just being completely loyal to one person and one person's lie is really, really bad politics. It was bad for our U.S. Senate candidate on the Republican side, for the gubernatorial candidate, for the secretary of state candidate, for the attorney general candidate. Uh, we, we swept those offices running on truth, running on rational thought, running on non-chaos and non-conspiracy. So from a political point of view, the folks out there who just want to live their lives and have government do its thing, yeah. they don't want extremists in government. There's still a loud portion of our population that loves that stuff. But the vast majority don't. And, and, and I think they're right. You and I talked uh, on October 29th in Phoenix. You and I talked, I think, the morning after you were uh, determined to have won your election. But the nonsense continues to go on in your election until two days ago. Your opponent, I think, did not give up on his election appeal, uh, Mark Fincham, until literally two days ago, right? Yeah, they finally gave up the, the tail end of the appeal. Uh, we're almost done putting a bow on that one. There are still some other cases out there, uh, just they're fewer and farther between. Again, this is just the nonsense that has abused even the judicial system. Yeah. And all of the lawyers in all those cases have been sanctioned uh, by the Supreme Court and other courts for bringing frivolous lawsuits. This entire thing, when you've got thinking people analyzing it, is proven to be a lie. But let me make this really important point, and I think it bears repeating. The people who have been hurt, not just the ones at the Capitol who, who unfortunately even some of them died, uh -huh. but folks out there who have lost careers because of the stress, because of the threats. Yep. We had an HR person at Maricopa County get called and harassed and get doxxed. I had to have my own family leave the house for a few days because of threats. Uh, you know, and, and, and the stories about our former Secretary of State and now Governor Katie Hobbs, it's just all over the place, and it's a real problem. So today's revelation uh, is a continuation of this by the former president, and what it really speaks to is this notion. That is that leadership matters, and Americans follow leaders in many ways. Unfortunately, some of them follow the wrong leaders down the wrong path, uh, and look where it's gotten him. Over 70 felony charges and three indictments. 
uh, and it looks like there's more to come. And there's not. This isn't. This is not a victimless crime. It, it, the victims are the people you just described. The victims yep. are our American democracy. The victim is the American voter who this indictment says very specifically has a right to vote and a right to rely on the fact that their vote will be counted. The, the, the victim here is very, very serious. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, Arizona Secretary of State Adrian Fontes, we always appreciate your time. Thank you, Alex. This has happened in different ways in different states, starting with uh, Kansas last year, uh, where despite what people think people think about abortion, Americans don't take well to certain rights being taken away. Everybody in Ohio knows what this actual referendum is about on Tuesday. Well, we hope that they do, and that's why we've been spending so much time uh, gathering our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, and letting them know that issue one is really a ballot initiative that is going to take away constitutional rights, is going to take away freedoms from Ohio, and something that we have enjoyed for over 100 years and allows us to create a check and balance to an extremist uh, state legislature in Ohio. And so now people are starting to hear uh, what is happening. They are getting engaged. They are invigorated. Uh, and quite frankly, they're angry at the fact that these extremists want to take away one of our uh, constitutional freedoms that we've enjoyed for over 100 years. Where are you seeing success and where do you have challenges between now and Tuesday in terms of demographics, uh, women, Republicans? Where are, where are people falling on this? Well, we are just concerned that people are unaware that there is an election on Tuesday, August 8th, and we're encouraging them to vote no. Uh, the state legislature eliminated August special elections because they knew that they were uh, had lower turnout, that people did not really participate, and it was not reflective of the general public. But because they wanted to sneak this past the voters in our state, they reinstated August elections just for this very issue. So so we know what's happening. They are trying to trick voters, but Ohio voters are smarter than this. This is why we've seen record amounts of people coming out energized to vote against this. We want our constitutional freedoms. We are going to fight for our constitutional freedoms, and we won't go back to politicians telling us what we're going to do in our lives. Interestingly, though, in your state, and this separate and apart from what people believe in terms of abortion, you have former Republican state officials who are coming out against this as well, who are saying vote no to this because they're more concerned about the anti-democratic nature of causing your referendums to, to have to have a 60 percent threshold than a 50 percent threshold. Absolutely. And when you have the former Republican attorney general go to an IBEW hall and rally people because she understands how important it is to protect our democracy, you know uh, we have an issue on our hands. And so we've seen our former uh, living governors, Republican and Democrat. We've seen our former living attorneys generals, Republican and Democrat, come together. There are coalitions across broad spectrums who are just concerned about the fact that extremists want to take away the right of the people of the state to talk to their government, to say we are not happy to provide that very necessary check. And it is appalling. It is disrespectful. It is offensive that they have gone to these great lengths to silence the people of the state of Ohio. That's why we're working so hard to turn this around and get as many people as we can out to vote on or before Tuesday, August 8th. To be clear, the November uh, vote about enshrining abortion rights in the Ohio Constitution will still go ahead regardless of, of uh, Tuesday's outcome. Absolutely. They were certified. But the one thing we know is clear from our Republican secretary of state. He said that this August 8th election is 100 percent about abortion. He said the quiet part out loud. Uh, and when a bunch of women had the nerve to organize themselves in our communities to protect our rights in this state, they did everything that they could to take it away from us. And that is why we are working so hard. Uh, we are encouraging everyone to pay attention to Ohio. We do not want any other state in this country to find themselves in the same position that we are in, uh, and we are going to do what we can to prevail on Tuesday to protect our rights. We're going to vote no uh, in August and yes in November to enshrine our rights to abortion access and reproductive care.